Maintenant, place à notre dernier conférencier. Jim Nysel est futur doyen de la Faculté de génie de l'Université McGill et professeur de génie environnemental au département de génie civil et de mécanique appliquée de McGill. En tant que chercheur, il est aussi détenteur de la chaire Vision 2020, comme les yeux, mais 2020, pour créer un campus durable à l'Université McGill. Il a aussi joué un rôle majeur dans la création du Bureau du développement durable à l'Université McGill. Alors, Jim travaille aussi à moins de 10 km de l'École polytechnique, mais il m'a dit qu'il fait un très, très grand détour pour venir. Alors, on va lui donner aussi 10 minutes. Et je crois que sa présentation va être en anglais. Alors, ça reflète aussi, donc, le bilinguisme des instituts trottiers. Merci. Euh, merci bien. Euh, je veux… Je vais faire mon euh, euh, présentation en anglais parce que je ne peux pas aller euh, plus vite. Ui, uh, mon nom, my name is Jim Nysel. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer working at McGill for the last 20 years. Um, part of my responsibilities, though, in the last six years has been uh, I was associate vice principal of university services in charge of the infrastructure at McGill, uh, which in itself is quite a, a, a struggle uh, to deal with many aged buildings, old infrastructure, and of course energy is a major issue. Uh, McGill University last year paid around $17 million dollars in energy uh, bills, which of course we'd rather have that work or that, that money actually go to the support of our students and our research. I, uh, I really just have one message, and that message about it is about achieving a balance. Um, and that balance really comes out of an imbalance that we currently are facing. So if I was to uh, explain to you uh, how we got where we are, it is a basically we started with a, we have been, uh, marching in a certain direction for a very long period of time in what I would refer to as a traditional industrial system. It's a system based on consumption where consumers themselves in, in consuming products and services in the world are actually uh, supplied that through a production system. And of course that production system has to draw upon the raw resources that are available to it in the world. And those raw resources are coming in the form of renewable resources and non-renewable resources. And ultimately, after we go through the consumption, the, the creation of the services and products, we end up inevitably producing waste energy, uh, some waste both domestic and industrial. And I, I can guarantee you that in the 39 hours of lectures that I do in my thermodynamics course, I will prove to you at the end of this that it's impossible to avoid uh, creating waste at the end of this. So we have to accept that as a given, but not the quantity of waste. The other issue here is that uh, as we expand our consumption and our production, we begin to encroach upon the constraints, the constraints that are imposed upon us. Either those constraints are imposed on us by the biosphere, the, the surrounding earth, or by some sort of cultural constraints. And I think, in fact, that this is a very optimistic picture because I think we're way beyond the constraints right now, and we're, in fact, we're eating into our future capital. So uh, being an engineer, I will not give you any equations today. I'll just give you some pumps and tanks as a diagram. But this is the way I like to envision this system. So this industrial system is effectively a pump, a pump that is driven, or driven by the solar flow, where the sunshine provides us the energy that we require, the resources we require, where we uh, consume resources, and ultimately at the back end of this, after producing our valuable goods, we produce a waste. This comes from the environment. This goes pushed into the environment. I would argue right now that our tendency is to have such a high rate of pumping here that we have actually a complete imbalance. So we have a net resource depletion going on over here, and we have an accumulation on the negative side. And the negative accumulation comes in the form of the waste products that are created here that cannot be assimilated fast enough in the environment to turn them back into raw materials so that they can enter back into the system. So the question is, how did we get here? Well, if you were in engineering class sitting uh, here, uh, say, 40 years ago in a, in a classroom, 50, maybe in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, you would actually hear one phrase used very, very often, and it's quite alarming to us these days. That is, the solution to pollution is dilution. This was actually drummed into engineers a very long time ago, and the presumption here, of course, is the world is a very big place. If it's a very big place, we can draw almost an infinite amount of resources from it, and thereby, after using our resources and consuming and creating products and, and ultimately ending up in waste, we have to put it somewhere. Well, the world is a big place. If we just spread it around big, uh, enough, then hopefully there'll be minimum impact. Well, I think we've actually approached the, the time, the age, where we all come to recognize that first, there's a limit to the capacity of the Earth for these resources, and two, there's a limit to the capacity of the Earth to actually assimilate and spread these wastes out in such a way that they're not detrimental to our long-term health. So if you're in the late 1970s, early 80s, and, and, and all the way through the 90s, you may have heard about the three Rs. Uh, actually, in, in a lot of circles, we talk about the four Rs, but it's a hierarchy. 
If the assumption is that we have a certain amount of resources and a limited capacity to produce waste that can be assimilated in the environment, what we could do is, uh, first of all, reduce our consumption, which reduces the overall flow passing through the system. We see some emphasis on reuse. Um, that's using a product over and over in the same form for a similar purpose again. Uh, I gave a lecture to a kindergarten class a couple of years ago, and one little girl came up to me and showed me a straw that she had, and she was very proud that she'd been using the same straw for six months in a row. <laughs> that, that, that may not be the best way to go about doing this, but the spirit and the intent was there, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, then there's recycling, which is taking those materials uh, and then converting them into some other raw material to be used in, ultimately in another process or the creation of another product. And then recovery comes out to, to recovering the embodied energy that are within a system so that we can turn that to valuable use without uh, tapping in perhaps into the energy to the resources coming from the environment. However, this has had a less than a satisfactory, satisfactory impact because it really hasn't actually addressed some major larger concerns re relating to the economy and relating to cultural and social uh, uh, issues. We haven't seen a complete take up on the reduction side, definitely, and we've even seen a habit such as recycling where people recycle, but now because they can recycle, they actually tend to consume more. So there's kind of a, a perverse reaction that keeps happening in human nature that seems to get in the way of our progress in this issue. Now, I'm very nervous about presenting a slide upon which there's a definition of sustainable development, especially in a university environment, because this has been debated endlessly. So all I would say is that this is a starting conversation that people had many years ago, starting in the 1970s and, and working its way through to the, Brundtland, the, sorry, the our Common Future World Commission on Economics and Development in 1987. And since then, we've moved a long way toward defining this thing called sustainability. If I was to put it in just a very simple way, it's just having the foresight now to think about the future. So it is purely having that, that, that foresight to start thinking about whether we have the capacity to endure as a society on our Earth within the limits of our biosystem. Now, many of you probably have seen diagrams of this type. The diagram here is trying to reflect that there, there is more than environmental considerations related to sustainability. There are social and economic dimensions. And the issue that, that we try to strive for in, in showing this kind of uh, diagram is that there's a sweet spot right in the middle, which is actually fairly small. And in fact, there's a tendency, as we'll see, to start pulling us in any one of these directions, which pulls us off the ultimate goal of sustainability. Now, some people don't quite like this diagram, and they, they would alternatively like to present it in this way. And the idea here is there's still a balance between economy, society, and the environment. But the difference here is that economy is at the service of society and therefore bounded by society's needs. But society also has to recognize that it works within a larger environment and there must, therefore that, uh, uh, that, that society and economy must work within that biosphere. Well, we have to think about those kind of issues when we start looking at renewable energies and the shift that we're undergoing, say, here in Quebec uh, as a province, where we have a major shift in going away from oil, natural gas, and coal. And actually, we had a shutdown just in December, late December of this past year, of our only nuclear power plant in, in Quebec. Uh, but we're moving on. Hydro's been around for a while, certainly growth in solar. Biomass is touted as, the, as a big future. Wind, geothermal, and tidal. But while a lot of these things people consider as being, these are dull and dingy, and these are very green and, and joyful, you've got to keep in mind all the secondary impacts that can come out of these sorts of things. So for example, biomass. There's a lot of excitement about biomass, and you see a lot of commercials on TV touting how wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use all this corn to burn in our automobiles to get us going where we want to go. But what we don't often talk about, though you're starting to hear about it more, is the fact that this biomass is actually being grown on valuable cropland that services are for food. So now we're creating an issue where it comes down to food security be, being threatened. Also, we don't talk about the fact that phosphorus, uh, um, mineral phosphorus supplies in this, this world are probably going to run out in about 100 to 125 years. And of course, that will be accelerated if we start using that as a, a place to grow our, our biomass in order to service our fuel needs. So my argument here is if we go back to that basic strategy of the four R's and we incorporate them into a larger system, what we'll do is if we look at consumption, and I'll note here that the consumption is drawn exactly to the same scale that it was in the original diagram. And so this just shows you the potential that there is associated with reusing materials to offset a certain amount of the consumption needs uh, in terms of offsetting what, where we're taking our renewable and non-renewable resources. There's the recycling that feeds back in and itself as well into a green production system. And ultimately, even within the industries themselves, within an individual enterprise or within many enterprises working in collaboration, there's a potential to offset all that as well. Now that has the advantage, of course, with if we get all these cycles working together under proper uh, uh, balance, what we end up is, is bringing our shift, hopefully, to more and more renewables and less non-renewables. 
bringing this all within the constraints that are currently on our growth. Now that's a very idealistic system. Now, it's wonderful and I think it's something we need to strive for. And certainly engineers have a major role to play when it comes to green production, particularly when it comes to the energy systems that we're looking at. But this is a very dynamic and very perverse system. And the thing is we've got to be very, very careful about the way these things all interact. So for example, if you start shifting your renewables and non-renewables so, so that you're well within the constraints of the biosphere and society, actually what that creates is a tendency for there to be an oversupply, and therefore an oversupply can actually lead to opportunities for greater demand. Greater demand means that consumption can actually start to grow, and ultimately these will expand again we within the constraints in our growth. So it's a very dynamic system where there's a lot of things that are actually always going to be pushing us in the wrong direction. So ultimately, while we want to achieve a balance in this dynamic system to bring this uh, uh, si situation to no net resource depletion and no net waste uh, uh, accumulation, the fact is there are many different things that are working together to try to confound this. And what we have to recognize is that we as a society, this is not just an engineering thing. This is not me as an incoming dean of engineering saying to you uh, that McGill engineers will be out there to save the world. We will do our best to save the world. But we're not going to accomplish it because a lot of people have to get it together to make this happen. So to keep that sweet spot there, in, in, uh, to achieve that sweet spot when it comes to sustainability, whether it's respect to energy or any other kind of production systems, we have to recognize that the population has a huge and a very important role to play, both in terms of democracy, in terms of responsible consumption, in terms of the way that we, the who we elect and how we elect and what we hold our politicians accountable. The government has a very important mandate to play here, a role to play in terms of the management of the overall system, making sure that we have peace, security, conservation, that we properly account for the costs of our various systems. Industries has a very important role to play here as well in providing a livelihood and goods and services that we actually require. But all of this has to be kept in a balance with the, the restraints that are put on us in nature to try to keep us right there. And the only way we're going to do it is every single person that is in this room and every person that you go home to in all your homes is actually directly involved in this overall process. And so that's the only message that I want you to take away from this tonight. Thank you.